Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. My grandmother, affectionately called Lady Marion by those who knew her well, was characterized by practical love, unwavering peace, and a wry sense of humor that often set her eyes twinkling at me in shared understanding. After she passed away, I soon realized that no one on earth would pray for me the way she had. As her oldest granddaughter and second oldest of 19 grandchildren, I was the beneficiary of decades of her faithful prayers. I was comforted by the knowledge that despite heartbreak, difficulties, and all the twists and turns life threw her way in an often harsh and unfair world, she still chose to put her trust in God. She didn't consider prayer to be a waste of her time. Indeed, I'm sure she would say that prayer was among the most valuable tools she had. She especially had a heartfelt desire for her children and her grandchildren to know God and be strengthened in their service to God. Like a wise parent or grandparent, Jesus prays for his beloved disciples. He asks for their love to continue to reflect the unity he shares with his father, especially at this crucial moment in their growth. His disciples will soon become a new community of faith. Following Jesus' death and resurrection, they will continue to live their lives in service to God and to his call. Jesus knew it would be only through supernatural love and unity as evidenced in his earliest followers that the world would come to see and to know God. In our present world, we look around and see disunity everywhere. The tragedies of our times are numerous. Violence, racism, countries occupied and people exiled. There is evil present in this world and it often dominates. The mass shootings of the past two weeks, which have taken the lives of the innocent, leave me numb and uncomprehending. Before I can even process my anger and grief, I am overwhelmed by media reports of blame, aggression, and even more division. It is perhaps even more alarming to witness others who proclaim peace and unity and love, only to see the facade exposed and the truth revealed for what it is, lies, deception, cover-ups, in the name of unity. False unity is so prevalent that many have become cynical and jaded. Disunity seems to be all around us, and that makes it hard to trust, hard to believe in any greater good. We may find ourselves feeling hopeless and resigned. Will unity ever be possible? Is it just a good idea? Nice to think about, but unrealistic in regular practice. Is fake unity the best we can do? What a contrast to Jesus' vision for unity in today's gospel. The themes of love and knowing and being known are intertwined and connected so tightly, it's hard to discern where one ends and another begins. To know God is to have God's love in us, because God is love. This love stretches back before the universe existed, is present with us now, and will continue to reach beyond us, connecting all of those who experience God's love in unity. God's own self, expressed in the mystery of the Holy Trinity, demonstrates how highly God values unity in relationship. The image of perfect unity is shown in God's own triune self. When we, ref when we reflect that perfection of unity in our daily lives with each other, we reflect God to those who are ready to see and believe. That is the essence of the power to change. And this is why unity is so central to Jesus' prayer. 
knowing he would soon be betrayed and crucified, Jesus had a broader view of the world than his disciples did. He knew their ministry would be threatened from every angle, from within and from without. And so he asks his father with an urgent intensity that the unity he shared with his disciples in life would continue to be manifested in the church after his physical departure. He wants it to continue and continue and continue even to today. Jesus came to make God's character, presence, and saving love known to his disciples. And as he prepares to leave them, his deepest desire for them is that they, united together, carry on that message of God's saving love to the world. In the years following Jesus' death and resurrection, his sending of the Holy Spirit, and as the Gospels themselves were written, sects and divisions arose, causing arguments and sharp disagreements. Jesus entrusts this future of the faith community to the Father, expecting the Spirit to come and strengthen and further unite the believers. Jesus is confident in the love of the Father, and we are invited to enter into that assurance and safety of God's love for us as we extend ourselves in love, service, prayer, and action to those around us. Jesus calls all of us to a united mission of proclaiming God's love, which then leads us how to discern we, how to work for unity both individually and as a community. Our culture has a tendency to interpret the scripture in an individualistic way. Yes, Jesus desires each of us to know and be known, to love and experience unity with God. That is essential. But in this prayer, Jesus calls us to go beyond our personal relationship with God, perhaps the easier part to attain, and to choose to work together toward unity as a community of believers. When we opt for what our own personal preferences are instead, when we get caught up in categorizing and criticizing, when we're mad about this or frustrated about that or disenchanted by people who have caused immense harm and even led others down destructive paths, in our fear, we opt instead for what we want, what feels safer to us and less vulnerable and we lose sight of our collective mission. Of course, there are various ways we each carry out God's good news, as it's diverse, as we each step out in our mission in different ways, whether it is feeding the hungry, advocating for the homeless and poor, serving our neighbors, using our resources and voices to bring forth positive change. How might remembering our shared Christian mission aid us in fostering unity and love. Just as the disciples needed it then, I believe we, as people of faith, need unity now more than ever. Perhaps it begins with faithful prayer and then dialogue and listening, both to God and to each other. David Taylor Klaus said, being listened to feels so much like being loved people can scarcely tell the difference. That might be one helpful place to start. As we discern together how God might be calling us to unite in mission, what might it look like to live out our lives of faith in unity? Like my grandmother, who prayed that I might be strengthened and sustained in my faith, Jesus prayed the same for his disciples and by extension for us. It is only through the divine unity Jesus' prayer describes that the church achieves any true unity at all. That is what has sustained the church for thousands of years, and it will continue. Jesus' prayer continues to be answered. Our presence is evidence of that. <laughs>